I took a long drag from a clove cigarette, the last of the bad habits I allowed myself. Well, other than my fashion sense, which was mostly now restricted to wearing heavy boots with office casual clothing. Both are remnants from my time as a goth, a fun phase of my life during college and into my early adulthood. I liked the music and the aesthetic, especially as worn by the girls, but I never really enjoyed the angst, especially after I got with Ellie. I met Ellie at a bad time in her life. Well, an especially bad time in her life. She had had a long string of bad luck that started before she was born. Her mother, Gloria, was a drug addict, abusive when she was around, but mostly absent. Instead, she was raised by her father, Don, a high school English teacher. Gloria had baby-trapped Don. He had been working on his master's in linguistics when he had the misfortune of being drawn in by her pretty face and wild personality. She fell pregnant with Ellie, and Don stepped up to do the right thing. It cost him almost everything, a promising career, the chance at a faithful wife, his health, and his self-respect. The only thing it gained him was Ellie, he considered it a more than fair trade. When are you going to stop smoking those things? I don't want you to get lung cancer, babe. I heard her sweet voice behind me on the balcony. I wasn't allowed to smoke inside. You made me give up drinking in pot. You've already improved my lifespan enough, L. I stubbed out the cigarette and turned towards her. Sue me. I'm greedy. I want to have as many years with you as I can. She stepped up on her tiptoes and kissed me. I do love the way you taste after you smoke them, though. I mean, I've got a while till I need to be at the doctor's office. I'd be happy to let you taste me some more. She bit her lip. Rain check, Han? I would think I would have tired you out last night. I have to get to the store. I encircled her in my arms and kissed her again. If you ever tire me out so much that I can't have another round with you the next morning, check to see if I'm a pod person. She withdrew and I swatted her ass. I suddenly remembered. Oh. Do you want me to get your appointment for your physical setup while I'm at the docks? She looked up. MMM, no. Thanks, but they're messing with the schedule at work right now. Not sure when I'm going to be able to go. She grabbed her keys and headed out. Got a long shift today, hon, see you tonight. I love to watch her walk. She was shorter than me, most people are. But she was so graceful, and the flowing skirts and peasant blouses she preferred always made me smile. Where I looked like what I was, a corporate IT drone losing the fight to maintain some sliver of individuality, she always looked like she'd stepped out of Haight-Ashbury in the late 60s. I smiled as I drove to my physical. Last night was great. Ellie had been extremely affectionate for the past couple months, and she was always affectionate to begin with. I knew that a dip in that was going to come soon, this had been a pattern with her for almost as long as I'd known her. I worried sometimes that she might have manic depression, but she didn't like the idea of being medicated. It wasn't a huge change, and her dips only lasted for a few weeks, but I worried about her. I suppose that was par for the course. I usually worried about her. As I said, I met Ellie at a particularly bad time in her life. She'd had a rough childhood, her father, constantly trying to make ends meet and therefore often absent, and her best friend, Derek, were the only real bright spots in it. Derek was from the next street over, he had a similarly bad childhood, and they bonded over it. They were friends, then dated when they got into school. They had been each other's first everythings, and Ellie had thought they'd be together forever. But Derek had different ideas. He was a very talented guitarist and a pretty good singer. Decent songwriter, too. When they were 20, he finally had to pick between Ellie and his dreams, and he picked his dreams. She took it really hard. Where Derek couldn't wait to get on the road, Ellie wanted to settle down and have a home and family. She craved the stable life that she couldn't have when she was a kid, and had hoped Derek would eventually decide that was what he wanted, too. When it didn't happen, she fell into a deep depression. Ellie was smart, she had gotten an academic scholarship and thrown herself into her studies. She loved poetry and writing, and was working on a degree in English when I met her. It wasn't much of a meet-cute, I was a gangly cheerful goth kid barely passing his IT classes while partying too much, 
and she was a petite depressed hippie chick trying to get through her first breakup. We ran into each other on campus. Literally. I hadn't been paying attention to where I was going. Truth be told, I was hung over from the night before and was trying to keep my head down to let as little light touch my eyes as possible. She got distracted by a text, and we slammed into each other, she got the worst of it, dropping her books and laptop on the ground. Oh god, I'm so sorry. Watch where you're fucking going, asshole. I reached my hand down and she glared but took it. We started to gather her things up, her books were fine, but when she tried to turn on her laptop, no dice. Fuck. Fuck fuck fuck. I can't afford to get this fixed. Why the fuck did you not look where you were going? Why the fuck didn't you? I I. She started to cry. I'm not great with emotions. My default is to be pretty low-key happy, but that's mostly because showy displays of emotion make me uncomfortable. That was rough for me as a kid, my family are loud folks, with big voices, big opinions, and big feelings. I often wondered if I was adopted, but I looked like a younger version of my dad, so that was pretty unlikely. Hey, uh, hey, it's, it's okay. We'll get it fixed. How? I can't afford it. I just fucking said that. Are you going to pay for it? Here. I took the laptop from her. Let's go to find some place to sit, and I'll take a look at it. Inside the student union, I found a relatively clean table and started assessing it. The case wasn't cracked, screen was fine, no obvious damage. I popped out the battery and put it back in. No dice. What are you doing? Troubleshooting. IT major. Give me a minute. I pulled out my multi-tool and started to take the case off. Whoa, hold on. Don't break it. I sighed. Look, uh, what's your name? Ellie. Ellie, great. I'm Tim. This is going to go a lot faster if you're not shouting at me. This isn't the first laptop I've repaired. I held out a tenor. Why don't you grab us a couple of drinks? Mountain Dew for me? She hesitantly took it and marched off. While she was gone, I got down to it. I popped the case and pretty quickly found the problem, a cable had come loose from the motherboard. I reseated it, put the case back on, and fired it up. It was at the lock screen by the time she was back with our drinks. Ta-da! I turned the screen to face her with a flourish. Oh my god! Really? Her relief was palpable. Should be fine now. Just a loose cable. I finally had a chance to really look at her. She was pretty. Stressed, but pretty. We looked oddly similar, both fair-skinned with blonde hair. Her eyes were green and mine blue. No one would mistake us for siblings, but cousins? Entirely possible. Oh, thank God. She breathed out. I'm sorry for shouting earlier. It's... I've had kind of a bad, well, a bad few months. I shook my head. No, it's okay. I should have paid more attention. I was trying to think of a way to get her to stay and talk. I didn't know much about her other than that she was pretty, but it was college and I was a guy. That was enough for a start. Well, I probably should have, too. She smiled and went to stand. Wait. Ah, uh, here. Let me text you my number. Just in case it has problems later. Slick, Tim. She raised her eyebrow, but went ahead and gave me her number. I guess I'm not too bad looking, it was college, and she was a girl, and that was enough reason for her, too. It's not exactly a love story for the ages, but we started to hang out, then became friends, then became friends with benefits, onto lovers, and then followed on down the chain until we were married a couple of years after we met. We made a funny pair, the happy goth kid and the mopey hippie girl, but the longer we were together, the less mopey she was. I met her father a few months after we started officially dating, and he thanked me for being a stabilizing influence on her. Don took me to one side after dinner and confided in me, I haven't seen her this happy in a long time. She's finally starting to think about the future in a positive way again, and I can't thank you enough for that. 
I ended up becoming close to him as well. By the time we were married, he was calling me son, which felt really good. He had the same attitude about big emotions that I did, and in some ways I felt more kinship to him than to my actual family. After we were married, I started to call him dad. Ellie was his only child. He was thrilled. I eventually started in my corporate IT career as a lowly network technician. It had good starting pay, and Ellie and I had limited needs, so she was able to stay at her college job at an actual, honest-to-God physical bookstore. She loved paper books, vinyl records, and all of the other media that was mostly kept alive because of nostalgia and stubbornness. Her schedule was always in flux, but we still found plenty of time to be together. Her attitude towards Derek shifted over the time we were a couple. Early on, she hated him when she talked about him at all. That was fine by me, no guy likes to hear about his girlfriend's ex. But eventually, her attitude softened. He started to have some success, mostly just at the indie slash small label level, but eventually got a little airplay. The music industry spinner had finally landed on singer-songwriter with guitar-based backup band again. One day we were listening to the radio in the car and he came on. I was going to change it, but she had me leave it on. She took my hand and kissed it. It's okay. Derek finally got his dream, and I got mine. I'm glad he's happy. Recently, we've been talking about having kids. We've been married for almost five years now, and I had gotten promoted to a lead role, it was probably going to be time to retire my boots soon. We were financially stable, and we wanted to have kids while we were still young enough to chase after them. Ellie went off the pill. We hadn't been trying, but we hadn't not been trying either, and it had been four months. I talked to the doctor about it at my physical, and he suggested I get some additional tests done, just a blood draw at one of those diagnostic places that specializes in it for now, not the more fun stuff when dealing with fertility issues. I had taken the morning off, so I headed for the nearest one a few miles away. It was coming up on lunchtime when they were done jabbing me, and there was a new cafe nearby that Ellie and I had been wanting to check out. I figured I'd kill two birds with one stone. I was about to enter the restaurant when I saw Ellie. And Derek. And they were kissing. I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. This couldn't be happening. Somebody must be playing a joke, a prank, one of those stupid YouTube stunts. My wife couldn't, oh God. I staggered as though I'd been punched. I shook my head. I had enough presence of mind to take out my phone and snap a few pictures, then I walked away, numb and in shock. I made it about half a block, turned the corner, and slumped down on a bus stop bench. I couldn't think. My mouth was dry, and I felt like I was going to throw up. An elderly lady saw my distress, and I think she asked if I was okay, but I couldn't respond. She could have been talking in Swahili for all the good it would have done. I texted my boss and told him I was feeling sick, something I ate. I somehow made my way back to my car. I couldn't drive yet, because I knew I'd get in an accident. Suddenly, I found the value in big emotions. I began to scream in rage, hammering on the steering wheel, shouting about that cheating whore and her dishabag boyfriend. I was going to fucking murder them both. I yelled, shouted, and howled with pain until I made myself hoarse. Then the tears came. How could she? Why would she? He had left her, I had been there for her, why? Why? I put my head on the steering wheel and cried until I couldn't anymore. Then, drained, I started the car and made my way back to our apartment. I packed a bag. Not mine. Hers. It was my name on the lease. I paid for all of our bills. We had no kids and there was no fucking way I'd ever touch her again. We were done. I considered having a beer, but that fucking cunt made me give up booze. I remembered her bullshit from this morning, oh, honey, I want to have so many more years with you. Yeah, so you can fucking fleece me while you bang your trash ex. Or, I guess not ex now. Fuck. Fuck fuck fuck. I had no idea when she'd be back, just late. I couldn't be here anymore. Back in school, I loved to run, loved the gym, loved martial arts. Another atypical thing for a goth kid. 
I hadn't done any of them in a while, but right now, I just needed to do something. Something physical to distract me from the emotional. I dug my old pair of running shoes out of the closet, switched into some shorts and a t-shirt, and just started to run. I was out of shape. But I also was probably dissociating, in that fugue state where you can push your body to do far more than it usually can because you've lost connection to yourself. I didn't know exactly how long I ran, or how far. I had the muscle memory to know how to run at a rate that would let me go as long as I could, but I had no conscious knowledge of where I was going or why. When my body finally got through to my brain that a failure was imminent, when my lungs were on fire, my muscles burned with lactic acid, and I simply could go no further, I fell against the side of a building in some part of town I didn't recognize. And. Just. Stopped. Stopped running, stopped thinking, stopped being in any way that mattered. An indeterminate amount of time later, my brain finally re-engaged. It was getting dark. I had no idea where I was, there were no familiar landmarks, none of the buildings contained businesses I recognized, and I had given up my marathon far enough from any street sign to see them in the dusk before the street lights turned on. Anyone who says you can't run away from your problems just hasn't tried hard enough. The super smart IT guy finally remembered that he lived in the 21st century. I pulled out my phone and checked the map app. Jesus. I'd made it almost seven miles before I collapsed. Amazing what sheer existential dread can drive you to. And then, oh, fuck, yeah, those were my legs. I moaned and groaned to my feet, feeling the fatigue, soreness, and blisters. Uber. Yeah. I'd get an Uber. My driver Amir and I stopped by a deli on the way back to my apartment and I bought us both some dinner. Just a sandwich and chips, but still. Hey, being a gig worker sucks, and I wasn't going to be having kids now, so why not buy the dude a sandwich? I had the fucking money. Got a six-pack for me as well. Amir could see I was pretty fucked up, and he dealt pot on the side, so hey, score. Hustle culture for the win. I scrolled through my text messages on the way. Oh, that's nice, Ellie let me know she was going to be late. Wonder what she was up to. Probably just slammed at work. Or getting slammed at work. Or on a desk. Dusha bag's couch. Our bed. Fuck. Once at my complex, I dragged my abused body up the stairs as carefully as I could, taking the steps gingerly as my body screamed at me for the abuse I'd inflicted. It was pretty slow, but I was getting there. Turned out the tortoise had lost the race that mattered, though. Aesop would be disappointed. Fuck it. I slumped down on the couch. I had a beer with my dinner for the first time in almost five years and it was fucking glorious. It was piss water, and it was still the best goddamn thing I'd tasted in forever. Tasted like pointless rebellion, drinking poison to spite my wife. I loved it. Lit up a joint from my new dealer, and puff puff puffed my way to temporary bliss. It was about two hours later that Ellie came in, sniffing the air. Is that pot? Jesus, Tim, what are you doing? What happened to you? I hadn't changed out of my sweaty clothes. I was tired, beat up, smelled bad, and Jew was still a little buzzed. Also? Pretty fucking high. Amir had some good shit. Me? Oh, nothing. You know, same old, same old. How was your day? She was really harshing my mellow. Tim, you're scaring me. What's going on? Ding ding ding, there's the bell. Time to get the fight started. You tell me, Ellie. How long have you been fucking Derek? She went as white as a sheet and began to stammer. I I I I. I think your starter motor's stuck, L want to take a second to figure out how exactly you're going to lie to me and begin again? Damn, I should argue high more often. She started furiously thinking then, her mouth opening and closing. I pulled out my phone and opened up the photo app, then tossed it at her feet. Let's just skip the lying part, Ellie. I went to the cafe to see if it'd be a good place to take you on a date. I snorted with amused indignation. Guess so. I looked down at the floor. So? How long? Tim, it's not. 
I was on my feet in a flash, adrenaline and rage overriding the red warning lights my body was throwing up in my brain. I was in her face, spitting with fury. How? Fucking. Long. Ellie. She shrunk away from me and started to cry. Two months. I just shook my head. Two months. Well, that's just fucking. Her voice, timid as a mouse. This time. This time. This. Time. Two syllables. Eight letters. And that's all it took to destroy my world. My brain started to put everything together, all at once. Derek was a touring musician. Ellie had been in her extra affectionate mode for two months. She got this way in irregular intervals two or three times a year for a month or two at a time. She was down for maybe a week or so afterwards. It had been going on back to, back to, oh, God. Oh, God. Back to before we got married. I don't know if it was the exhaustion, the pot, the beer, or just the sudden destruction of reality as I knew it, but I couldn't stay on my feet anymore. Jesus Ellie. Jesus. I pushed my way past her to our bedroom, trying to get there before my legs gave out. I did, just barely, falling onto the edge of the bed and holding my head in my hands. Six years? Six years you've been cheating on me? Why, why did, we got married, L. You married me. The tears came now, harder than they had before. It had been one thing to think my wife had fallen out of love with me. It was another to learn she never had been in love with me in the first place. She had followed me into the room and kneeled in front of me, trying to catch my eye. Because I love you Tim. I still love you. You're the best man in the world. I started laughing. I couldn't help it. The tears rolled down my face as I heaved with laughter. I couldn't even respond. Her voice became more insistent. Please, Tim. Please. I mean it. You are the best man I've ever met. You make me feel safe and loved. Please, I need you to. I snapped then. I need you to get the fuck out of my life. You worthless, cheating cunt. Stop standing here lying to me, get your bag, and leave. She gasped and reached out for me, what, Tim? No. No, I'm not going to leave you like this. I don't want you to hurt yours I slapped her hand away and, overextended from kneeling, s. He landed on her ass. I'd never laid a hand on her before. I'd never laid a hand on a woman at all. Hell, outside of martial arts in high school, I hadn't hit anyone since I was in the fourth grade. Fuck, L, I'm sorry. I stopped. No. Fuck that. I shouldn't have hit you, but you shouldn't have tried to touch me. Did you think you were going to talk your way out of this? That I'd still want you after you let that diseased prick slide into you? Is it just him, or have you been fucking his whole band, too? How big of a fucking whore are you, Ellie? I'm not a whore. Sudden anger in her eyes. She reared back. I was too stunned to block her, this was Ellie. She couldn't even kill a bug, always had to get a piece of paper and put them outside. I felt her hand impact my cheek, a loud, full-on slap. The gloves were off. I hadn't laid a hand on her before tonight, but I guess it was a good night for it. My adrenaline surged again, even as the warning lights in my head started to go from flashing red to burnt out black. I grabbed her by the arm, gripping her so tightly that I'm sure I left bruises. Ellie whined in pain as I hauled her to her feet. She stumbled, but I just dragged her with me, grabbing her suitcase on the way out of our bedroom. Our bedroom. What a fucking joke. Tim, please. Stop. I wasn't the strongest guy, but Ellie was tiny and afraid. She struggled, but there was no chance for her to resist. We got to the front door, and she began to beg. No, Tim, no, please, I'm sorry, I love you, please, we need to talk, babe, I. Don't fucking babe me, you goddamned whore. My voice was a roar, and she shrank back, prey trying to escape a predator. I had been Tim, her babe, her love, her cuddlebug. She didn't recognize the person she saw. 
Good. She was beginning to understand how I felt. I opened the apartment door and hurled her suitcase through it. Our neighbors were starting to poke their heads out. I shoved her through. She stumbled and fell to her knees. I sneered down, looming in the doorway. You can get the rest of your shit later. Have your dad call me, I'll arrange it with him. I don't want to see your face or hear your voice again. Tim, wait, my purse. It was by the door. I snatched it up, opened it, and fished her keys out, then threw it at her. Not to her, at her. But my keys, I need. I paid for it. It's in my name. It's not yours anymore. But how am I going to get to my dad's? The sheer fucking audacity. Call your dad, call your boyfriend, call an Uber. Hell, go turn tricks on the corner for bus fare, whore. I don't give a fuck. I slammed the door on my life. I turned the bolt as she banged on the door, begging to be let back inside so we could talk, begging for her keys, begging for someone she never really valued at all. I slid down the door, grief welling up in me. Shame at how I'd let my emotions get away from me, from the rage that almost, that almost. Jesus. I almost hit her. There was a moment there, after she slapped me, that I almost decked her. I didn't want to be that person. I started grieving anew, not just for the loss of my love, but for the loss of my sense of self. All of the warning lights in my brain went black. The gauges flicked to max and then to off. I couldn't stay upright, even seated. My body tumbled on its side, and I fell asleep to the sound of the most important person in my world pounding on the door and crying. Beep 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 beep. Where? Oh fuck. Shit. Why did everything hurt? Oh god. Oh. Oh god. Ellie. Oh god. I slowly pulled myself up to sitting, my neck and back felt like I'd been in a car crash, and my legs were shot. My hands were still working, though. I managed to fish my phone out of my pocket and silence the alarm. There were text messages from Ellie, of course, and Don. Don's were full of concern for me. That was really touching. Some dads would be haranguing me about how I'd hurt their daughter, but Don just wanted to see if I was okay. But then, I guess he'd been through the same thing. Ellie's were almost all pleas. A little anger at being thrown out, but mostly entreaties, please talk to me. Please don't do anything rash. Please don't hurt yourself. Please don't throw us away. Little late for that one, L. I was going to be late for work. That was just a given at this point. I limped to the bathroom and stripped off my clothes. They reeked of sour sweat and pot. So did I, for that matter. I pissed in the shower and did a cursory cleaning, then brushed my teeth. My jaw ached where Ellie had hit me. The guy staring back at me in the mirror looked like Ed Norton in Fight Club, just before he got into the fight with his boss. Hopefully that wasn't in the cards today, but it had been a week full of surprises. I got into work almost a half hour late. I could barely walk. I looked like I had been mugged and wished it had been only that painful. My manager, Al, came to my desk to see why I was late, but he recoiled when he saw me. Jesus, Tim, what happened? There are few things more emasculating than breaking down at your desk at work, but most of those had happened to me in the last 24 hours, too. Al gave me the rest of the week off. He was a decent guy, and he'd been divorced before. In his office, he commiserated with me, he had found her in bed with a guy 10 years younger and 50 pounds lighter than him. At least you don't have kids, Tim. I know it's cold comfort now, but you can just get her out of your life. With a manly slap on the back, he sent me out into the world to do nothing. It was the middle of the week and the middle of the day. My friends all had jobs. My body was wrecked from my run and my grief. I tried to think of a place to go. I had no appetite. I was too distracted to enjoy a movie. I wasn't quite to the day drinking stage yet. There was no way I could repeat my run from yesterday, probably not for a week the way I felt right now. 
I sat in my car and procrastinated until I finally admitted that the only place to go was home. I started researching divorce in our state. We had no kids, few possessions, and no real property. It was a community property state, so she'd probably get one of the cars, all of her books and records, her clothes, and half of the cash in our account. Maybe alimony. Whatever. It was a bargain to be rid of her. Hell, I could start the paperwork myself. I sat on the couch and started flipping through Netflix, looking for something that was engaging enough to distract me, but not good enough that I cared about tainting its memory by watching it while I was still so torn up. I hadn't decided on anything when I heard a knock at the door. I expected Ellie. Or maybe Don. I opened the door and Derek said, dude, I'm sorry. This isn't how I wanted to meet you. My fist clenched and I started to feel rage, but then. I just couldn't. I was so tired. Exhausted. This was just another indignity tossed onto a heap of indignities and I was crushed under their weight. This douche, with his neck tattoo and messy black hair that must take half an hour to arrange just so, was the pickle on the shit sandwich of my life. I could only start laughing. Can I come in? I think we need to talk. I was still laughing, and this was what it took to make me double over. This is what my life had come to. We were on the third floor. The stairwell was open, and it was only 20 feet away. Part of me said why not just go pitch him over that. You've got half a foot and 30 pounds on him. Another said, you know, you could just go pitch yourself over it instead. The last one, the really crazy one said, you've been on this ride far enough, why don't you see where this goes? Invite him in. You can always murder him later. I just turned my back on him, still laughing, and beckoned. He reluctantly entered and sat on a chair while I flopped onto the couch. Okay, asshole. You think we need to talk? I think you just came into the apartment of the man whose wife you've been fucking, and he's between you and the door. So you better have something really fucking amazing to say, or you're going out that window. Derek didn't seem like the sharpest tool in the shed. I think he was the type of guy that really felt things, man. The type of guy that gets how hard this is, bro, that feels your pain. He expected his dime store faux soulfulness to get him through this, just as it probably got him into girl's pants. Into my girl's pants. He sighed. You're mad. I understand that. I snorted. Oh, do you now? You understand how mad I am that my wife has been cheating on me with you since before we were married? That I only found out because I saw her sucking face with you in public? That I've wasted my almost my entire adult life with some fucking whore that bangs a knockoff Jack White when my back is turned? Oh, but I guess only when you're back from tour. So I get her the rest of the time. Lucky me. He looked at me with pain. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Lucky you. You get to have her in your life all the time. I'll never get that. I snorted. Well, you can start now, Derek. She's not going to be in my life anymore, so you're free to take her off my hands. Oh, wait, you already did. He bowed his head. No, I didn't. I couldn't take her off your hands. Even if you are done with her, and I don't think you. I don't give a fuck what you think, asshole. Even if you are done with her, I couldn't take her off your hands, man. She'd never leave you. You're the man she needs. I think. I think that even if you can't take her back, she'll never be with anyone else. Good. Fuck her. He looked at me. I know you're hurt. I know she. I know we hurt you, dude. I'm sorry. I wish we hadn't. But please don't take out your anger at my weakness on her. Your weakness. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? He looked out the window, the one I'd threatened to toss him out of. When I left Ellie behind, dude. It was the hardest thing I'd ever had to do. I loved her. I don't think I'll ever love another person as much as her. But, but I loved my dream more. I'd always wanted to be up on stage, playing guitar and singing. 
and, at first, it was everything I wanted it to be. I growled, good for you. Get to the part where you decided to ruin my life. He nodded. Ellie was my muse. I knew that. But I had hoped. I had hoped that the memory of her in my heart, the pain I felt from leaving her, maybe that would be enough to inspire me. It was, for a little while. But then it wasn't. After we got back from the second tour, I started trying to write new songs. Nothing came. I just couldn't, man. Ellie wasn't there. He lowered his head. I hadn't intended to. I knew I couldn't be what Ellie needed me to be. But I hoped maybe I could be her friend. I came to her at the bookstore. She was so angry at me, and I knew I deserved it. But I apologized for leaving her the way that I had. Not for leaving her, we both knew that was a lie. But for doing it so abruptly. And, well, you know Ellie, man. I scoffed, but he ignored me. She's so kind. So forgiving. We went out for a coffee to talk. Talk, sure. I rolled my eyes. He looked at me. It was just talk, man. I promise. She told me about you, about how happy you made her. She was sure you were the one. I shook my head. No, dude. I'm not bullshitting you. I knew that look in her eyes. It was love. She'd felt it for me, but I knew it paled in comparison to what she felt for you. You. I saw a tear in his eye. You were going to give her everything I hadn't been able to. I was so happy for her, man. His voice cracked. So jealous of you. You got to be her fairy tale. I was just the guy that couldn't keep her. My voice dripped with contempt. Give me a break with your fucking pity party and get on with it. He nodded. I got home afterwards and was able to write again, really write. The songs were good, man, better than the stuff I'd written when me and Elle were together. But I started to run dry again. I called her and asked her if we could hang out some more. She was reluctant at first, didn't want you to worry about her. She, dude, I really fucked her up when I left the first time. I know that. I know you picked up the pieces, man. She didn't want to put you through that again if I flaked on her as a friend, too. That's why she didn't tell you about us hanging out at first. We started out meeting for coffee. Then she came over to my place to check out the new songs. Then, then we had a few drinks and... Yeah, no, I fucking get it. Then you fucked my girlfriend. Or was she my fiancé by then? He looked away. Not yet. She was so guilty afterwards. She wanted to run straight to you and tell you everything, but I, dude, I convinced her not to. Told her that it would kill you. It's my fault. All of it is. Especially, especially what came next. There was anguish on his face. Real anguish. The guy seemed, frankly, to be too stupid to be a decent actor. I knew that I needed her. Needed my muse, yeah, but needed her in my life. I hadn't realized. I convinced myself that I could get along without her light as long as I had my music. But I couldn't. I was greedy. I wanted to have everything. I came back to her at the bookstore a week later. Played her the songs I'd written after we, after. He couldn't look at me. I, God help me, I tricked her. Got her convinced that, as long as she was everything she could be with you, that she, she could still be my muse. That we could still be together sometimes, that she'd help my art. Dude, we'd been so much for each other when we were younger, given so much of ourselves to each other that, that it just made sense. To her. To both of us. She felt guilty at first, but she, it just became normal, you know? It had nothing to do. If you finish that sentence, I will break your fucking neck. It was said coldly. Without emotion. And it was the absolute truth. He stopped and nodded. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. It sounds like bullshit to me, too. 
but we convinced ourselves it was true. I, I convinced her of that. It felt like that, because, because nothing happened. You didn't find out. The world didn't explode. It was just how our lives were, and you were both happy. I was happy, too. But it was a shitty thing to do to you. It was a shitty thing I got her to do to you, dude. But please, don't punish Elle for that. I just laughed again. Punish her. Like I'm grounding her for staying out after curfew. She fucking cheated on me, dude. A horror suddenly appeared unbidden on the horizon of my mind. Were you even using protection? I hadn't even thought about that until just now, my brain too focused on the pain to think logically. Oh, fuck, I needed to go get tested. He paused. At first. We. I missed, missed feeling her. I told her I'd stay celibate for the last month on the road. Get tested when I came back. Make sure you were safe. She insisted on that. That was a few years ago. We were so far along, man, it just, it felt normal to. He spread his hands, as if I'd find the answers to why my wife would let a touring musician go raw on her somewhere in those empty, outstretched palms. Oh my god. I would have thrown up if there was anything in my stomach. Get out. Just get the fuck out of my house. I stood. I'd had enough time to rest, to let my batteries recharge. The anger was returning. Wait, dude, please, I'm begging you. Don't punish Ellie because of me. I've known her since we were kids. I knew what buttons to press, how to play on her sympathies. I'm the bad guy here. I am a bad guy. I know that. But please, please. I'm begging you, man. You're her dream. You're the good guy, you're her good guy, she's always called you that. The best man I've ever met. Please, don't take that away. Please, don't take your love away from her, dude. It'll kill her. He started to half stand, but I was already grabbing him by the collar. I dragged him to the door and tossed him out. I was getting good at it. Tell the whore I'll have some papers for her to sign soon. I slammed the door in his face. Once back on the couch, I just stared at the ceiling. I still loved her. That was the real bitch of it. I hated her now, too. I never thought I'd be able to hate her. But I loved her. If she had told me about this, if she'd come to me before I found out. If she'd confessed and cried and apologized and begged, maybe, maybe I could have gotten past it. But this, finding out like this. I just, God. I needed someone to talk to. Someone besides her and the asshole. Someone besides my big loud family. Someone who'd been through this. Someone who knew everyone involved. Someone who I could trust to be, if not impartial, then fair. I grabbed my keys, got in my car, and drove. Hey, son. Don wrapped me in a big, loving hug. I started to tear up, and he held me at arm's length. Hey, now. It's going to be okay. We'll figure this out. He led me inside his house. He already had coffee made, and he poured me a cup, cream and no sugar, just like I liked it. Back in my goth days, I'd say pale and bitter, just like I like my women. That changed when Elle came around. I liked her sweetness once she was past her gloom. I guess she'd been getting her sugar somewhere else for a while, though. We sat at his kitchen table, the same one where I had sat with him when Ellie introduced us. The same one where I'd asked him for her hand, old-fashioned, maybe, but he had really appreciated the gesture. I sat for a while, collecting my thoughts. He gave me the space I needed, but he was always there as a comforting presence. Finally, I was ready to talk. He had spoken with Ellie, knew I'd thrown her out. Knew the shape of why, of what she'd done. But he had little in the way of details. I filled him in on everything I had learned from the asshole. He just shook his head sadly. I thought I raised her better than that. I'm sorry, Tim. You deserved better. He took a deep breath. Have you decided what you're going to do? 
I took a drink and thought long and hard about it. I don't know. I'm incredibly angry. I hate her, but I still love her. But I don't think that's enough. I can't trust her anymore. He was contemplative. Mmm, -hmm, I don't know about that. No, I get it, I understand why you're looking at me like that. But? He looked up at the ceiling. Ellie isn't Gloria. I know you came to me for advice, but I want to start there. Gloria was always a snake. I hate to speak ill of the dead, but she was. He looked at me seriously. Gloria was an addict. She ran around on me, stole from me. Trapped me in a marriage because she wanted someone that she could use in abuse. She never loved me. Ellie isn't like that. I know that's hard for you to see right now, but she's not. He stopped, trying to decide if he should tell me what he needed to. Then he nodded to himself. Son, I love you. I'm going to tell you something very few people know, Ellie isn't my daughter. Not my biological one anyways. She's the same sandy blonde as me, and she looks so much like her mom other than that. I just assumed, even after I knew that Gloria cheated on me. I didn't find out until she was eight, when she got hurt in an accident. They were trying to figure out blood types and there's no way she's mine. It's not biologically possible. Oh my god. Don, I'm so sorry. He smiled kindly. Thank you. It hurt at the time, but I realized, by then, it didn't really matter. She's my baby. I'll always love her. DNA's just DNA. It doesn't make us who we are, not really. It's just a part of it, and the way we're raised is what matters most. That's what I've always thought. Don's voice broke. And I am sorry, son, I raised her wrong. I know that she's a sweet girl. She's loving and smart, wouldn't hurt a fly. At her core, she knows right from wrong. But she. S always been, well, a little gullible. A little too trusting. And Derek. The pain on his face was evident. I never disliked the boy. He was a good friend to her, and they were there for each other when I couldn't raise her like I needed to. It made her reliant on him. And when they started dating, I knew he would break her heart. I was secretly glad when he did. I thought she'd be free of him. I recognized his type. He's not so much a bad guy. I scoffed. I'd like to see who you think is bad, if you think he's not. He frowned, not at me, but at himself, for not keeping Derek away from his daughter. He's weak. He's a weak boy who thinks he's a man. He's needy. Artistic. There's nothing wrong with being artistic, mind. I teach English, and I know art is one of the highest aspirations of humanity. But he got in his head the notion that he needs the adulation that goes with being an artist, rather than the joy of the art. I get that, no one likes to think they're shouting into the void. But it's made him egotistical. It's made him feel like the world owes him. His brows furrowed. I want you to think about your talk with him. How much was it about Ellie? Really about Ellie? And how much was it about him? I ran the conversation back through my head as best I could. It was almost all about him. About how this was all his fault, about how he couldn't have her, how he manipulated her. He was apologizing and asking me to take her back, but it was all about him and what he'd done. I assumed it was so that I wouldn't blame her, that I'd put it on him. Don frowned. That makes sense. The boy's got a bit of a martyr complex. Goes with the ego. Anything good that happens is because of him. Anything bad that happens is, too. Like I said, a boy, not a man. He took a deep breath before continuing. I'm not going to try to tell you what to do. That's up to you. But I will say that I think you can trust Ellie, maybe. Derek is a manipulator. I think she already knows how badly she's messed things up. I know she loves you. What she's done to you is awful. But I know that she loves you dearly. Anyone who sees you together can see that. I wouldn't call you son if you were just her husband. 
You've earned that by being the very best man for her that you can be. And I want you to know that, even if you can't stay with her, that's always what I'll consider you. I started to tear up. I, thank you, dad. I just. I couldn't speak. The emotion took my voice from me. He patted my shoulder. If Ellie gets away from him, I don't think she'll ever be taken in by him again. And there's no one else that's ever had the kind of influence on her that he did, other than you. He looked away and quietly, sadly said, including me, I suppose. But then he took a deep breath and continued. I can't lie to you. If I had my druthers, you'd go over to Derek's place, take her hand, tell her to never see him again, and resume your lives. Get some counseling and find a way forward. You've been so good for her, and I think she's been good for you, too. But I can't tell you that's the right thing for you. She's not Gloria, and you're not me. I will say one thing, though. People will tell you that you need to forgive her to move forward. But that's, it's not quite right. I forgave Gloria so that I could stop hating her. So I could try to be a good father to Ellie. But I did it wrong. He took a sip of coffee. I've always loved linguistics. The way that words come together, how languages evolve to take up or drop bits from other languages, or file off rough edges they don't need anymore. Sometimes that's good, we don't have gendered nouns in English, so no la or l to deal with. But we also don't have a second person plural. You is supposed to do double duty, which means a whole host of other words have sprung up to fill that need, y'all, use, you, you, and s, and the like. Language is always imprecise. It's an attempt to convey ideas in a concise way, at its core. But that means that, in English, we just don't have words for all the things we need to say. It's why we import words like schadenfreude from other languages. But we don't have, or at least I don't know of, a word from another language that we can use in place of forgive for what we're talking about and recovering from the harm people do to us. Some people use accept, but that has its own connotations. Neither of them is right. I didn't get that when I was younger. I forgave Gloria in the Christian sense. The forgive and forget sense. I let her back into my life, but I did it with no preconditions. I trusted her, or tried to. When she failed me again, she flung my forgiveness back in my face, tried to use it as a get out of jail free card. She used it as an excuse to keep acting badly. And my well-intentioned forgiveness meant she ended up dead in a flophouse with a needle in her arm. He looked me in the eyes. I don't have a word for what you need to do. Forgive is too slippery a word for it. You need to be able to let go of your anger. I heard that you manhandled her. I started to open my mouth. Don't. You shouldn't have done it, and you know it. I know you'll apologize. I also know that I did the same with Gloria. It was wrong, our anger doesn't make it right. And you can't keep that with you, or it'll kill you. Could end up hurting the people. He stopped, miserable about the next thing he'd need to say. If you can't be with Ellie, it could end up hurting the woman you love next. So, yes. Learn to let go of the anger. Forgive her, if that's what works for you. But don't forget, and don't give her a pass on what she's done. I hate to say that, she's my baby girl. But she needs to learn from you what she didn't from me. She needs to learn that her actions have consequences, no matter how she was manipulated into them. That doesn't mean you need to scorch the earth, but don't just take her back without protecting yourself, either. Don't be me, son. I nodded. So, what do you think I should do next? Don smiled. I think you know. There's only one person in all of this that you haven't talked to. Shit. I was hoping you'd have another option. He stood up, and so did I. He hugged me. It was always going to come back to you and her, son. No getting around that. I left and texted Ellie. She responded almost immediately, agreeing to meet. But she insisted on meeting at Derek's place with him there. He was afraid that I might hurt her. I hated to admit it, but he was right. I didn't like what that said about me, but I couldn't deny it was true. 
If things went wrong, if tempers flared, I hated her so much right now that I might. The next morning, I found his building. It wasn't as seedy as I was expecting, I know musicians don't make great money. But it wasn't some firetrap tenement building. Instead, it was an old converted warehouse space that had been turned into apartments. I knocked on the door to Derek's unit and Ellie answered. She was so pretty. She always had been. My heart melted when I saw her puffy, red-rimmed eyes. She looked like she wanted to hug me. Three days ago, I would have already swept her into my arms with a promise to do whatever I could to take away her pain. But now, I was the source of her pain, as she was of mine. Not the cause of it, that was all on her. And the catalyst for our pain was lurking in the room just beyond the door. Elle timidly said, Hi. Please come in. She stepped aside, not touching me. The space was exactly what the mind conjures when someone says, touring musician's apartment. Cinder block shelves, cable spool coffee table, milk crates as both storage and additional seating. Ratty chairs and couch, maybe from thrift stores and maybe from dumpsters. Brick walls and bare floors completed the look. I wondered if I'd contract hepatitis just from standing in the room. On the wall, though, were an array of guitars, maybe a dozen of them, with a few more on stands scattered around the room. I knew nothing about guitars, and only a little more about music in general, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. But I still recognized that I was looking at thousands, maybe tens of thousands of dollars in musical equipment. My host sat on one end of the couch and my wife on the other. I idly wondered how often they'd fuck there. As Derek sat, he gestured to a chair. I considered petulantly remaining on my feet, but my legs were still killing me. I sat on the uncomfortable, torn chair and decided I should have kept standing. We all looked at each other. It was my meeting, so I figured I should start. I've heard what Derek had to say. I know how I feel at the moment. But Al, I thought I should give you a chance to speak. She sighed. I tried to do that when you told me. No. Stop. Fucking stop. You don't get to play the victim in this. At all. At least not when it comes to anything I've done. The second you do that, I walk out the door and I contact a lawyer. Do you fucking understand? This was off to a bad start. I was already angry, and she showed no sign of understanding how fucked things were. She reluctantly nodded. I'm sorry. I've just... I know I wronged you. I did. But it's been hard for me to, to admit who I am. What I've done. How badly. She teared up. How badly I've hurt the best man I've ever known. My husband. I she sobbed. I felt for her, a little, but she had started this off the wrong way. I gave her a moment to collect herself, then said, just say what you have to say, Ellie. She took a deep breath. There's no excuse for what I've done. Derek manipulated me, that's true. He looked uncomfortable, but not nearly as much as I'd have liked. But I let it get to that point. I should have let you know I was meeting him in the first place. I should have. I should have told you when I cheated. Given you a chance to get away from me, if you couldn't let me try to make amends. She looked down. But I can't apologize for marrying you. For cheating on you, yes. That was wrong. And I should have. I should have let you know I cheated on you before I married you, like I said. I should have stopped immediately. But I, God, I love you so much. You're my everything. Clearly not. She reacted like I'd slapped her. I wondered if it would have been kinder. You are. Yes, I. I slept with Derek. And I won't lie, I enjoyed it. I felt grateful to be his muse. He looked at me in a way that you didn't. I knew he adored me, but he knew he'd never again have me, all of me, like you do. I was his unattainable girl, the one he. Cut the bullshit, L. You were clearly quite attainable. I don't want to hear about how sorry you are because it seems like the only thing you're really sorry about is that you got caught. I lowered my head. If I hadn't caught you, 
How long would this have gone on? For the rest of our marriage? Derek said, no. No, dude. Ellie wanted to come clean with you. That's what we'd been talking about at lunch that day. I rolled my eyes, and Ellie said, yes. I know you have no reason to believe me, but that was the truth. I was going to tell you the night I came home. Sure. That's why he had his tongue down your throat in the middle of a cafe in broad daylight. Clearly, the shame had become too much for you. Why the fuck would I believe a single word either of you said? Derek looked at Ellie encouragingly, and she turned her face to mine. We were cutting things off. That was going to be our last time together. I'm pregnant, Tim. Wha, what? My head spun. This had gone from being a nightmare to a vision of hell. She nodded. About a month and a half along now. She could see me doing the calculations in my head and said quietly, yes. It could be Derek's, but we both hope it's yours. I put my head in my hands, trying to get the room to stand still. I took some deep breaths, focusing on the floor below me as I tried to regain equilibrium. Derek said, hey, do. Shut. Up. I staggered to my feet. I needed to pace. Needed the pain in my legs to help me focus through the pain in my heart. So, what, you were going to come home and say hey babe, just a heads up, I'm pregnant, and it could be from the guy I've been seeing behind your back for the last six years? Did you think that was going to go any better than this already has? She wouldn't look at me. I was going to confess and apologize. I know. I know you're a merciful person, Tim. I'd do anything to make this up to you, and I know you don't want to hurt me, even though I've hurt you so terribly. You're so good. Stop telling me how fucking good I am. I shouted and both of them pulled back into themselves. I'm so fucking sick of people saying that, as though it means they can shit all over me and expect me to let it go. God, you selfish bitch. And you, you douchey asshole. Fuck me, I wish I'd never met you, L. I stalked over to the wall with the guitars, just looking for a place to lean for a moment, to think, to recover. I saw Derek tense up. I don't know guitars. But I know what a collectible in a place of pride looks like. In the center of the wall was a guitar, signed with a dozen names I didn't recognize, next to a numbered card, 37-100. It looked expensive. Cherished. Irreplaceable. I picked it up off the wall, and Derek started to stand. He called out, dude, wait but I had already brought it above my head in two hands and swung it by the neck like an axe, trying to chop a hole in the floor. The neck splintered and broke, and the body shattered into a dozen pieces. His mouth hung open. Did I feel better? Only a little. But there was a whole wall of these fucking things waiting for me. I expected him to shout, to scream, to wail like a child. But he surprised me. He picked up a ratty little guitar from a stand next to the couch and approached me slowly, holding the instrument in both hands, as though offering it in tribute. Here. Do this one next. It's the first one I bought myself from my after-school job. I played it until I could afford something better. The one you smashed was my rarest, but this is the one that means most to me. He bowed his head. Smash all of them, if that's what it takes. But please, please. Don't hurt Ellie. Take her back. Let her have her fairy tale again. He had expected me to feel remorse to see it as a big romantic sacrifice for her. But it just disgusted me. You fucking asshole. He perked his head up. What? Assholes like you think love is about these grand fucking gestures. Writing her songs, showy displays of affection, big dates, all of that. And that's important, the big things matter. But the small things matter more. I brought the splintered neck of the guitar up under his chin and tipped his head up to look me in the eyes. Ellie tensed on the couch. When's the last time you brought a girl chicken soup when she was sick? Made sure you paid a bill that she forgot to, without making her feel like shit about it? What about just making sure there was always a roof over her head, food on her table? 
rubbed her feet when she had a long day, not because you were hoping to fuck her afterwards, just because she needed it? Huh, asshole? He stayed silent. That's what love is. That's what love in a marriage is. It's reliability, trust, respect. Sometimes passion, you try to keep that alive. I thought we had. I guess not. I rounded on Ellie. But I guess we didn't have any of those at all, huh? Maybe asshole here has the right idea. Maybe it's just about seeing how many girls you can get to drop their panties by being the showiest peacock. Because it's not like we had any of those things in our marriage, even from the beginning. She piped up, that's not. Respect, Ellie. Can you actually say you respected me? Fucking your ex behind my back? Reliability? Well, you could rely on me, but I sure couldn't rely on you. And trust? I shook my head. Yeah. I can see where that got me. I dropped the neck and started to walk out. She cried, but what about the baby? I turned and looked at both of them. Seeing them together, him standing and her seated, I got it. I understood, they were telling the truth. She was going to confess to me. Because she had to. Ellie and I were funhouse mirror versions of each other, tall and broad, short and petite, but both pale and blonde. Different eye colors, but close enough in appearance to be cousins. Derek was olive-skinned, with curly hair as black as coal and eyes only a shade lighter. My voice burned with a cold fury. You would never have told me if you hadn't gotten pregnant. She shifted uncomfortably. You would never have told me if Derek had looked like us. If you could have hidden what you'd done. You would have done just what Gloria did with Don. You would have cuckled at me, actually cuckled at me, let me raise another man's child. I looked at Derek. Which one of you realized you had to tell me? He looked down, and then at Ellie. I nodded. Well. I guess the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. She looked at me with rage. What did you just fucking say? You slept around on me. You were going to have me raise someone else's kid. I pulled my wallet out of my pants and fished out two twenties, then crossed to the table in front of her and slapped them down. Here. Go find a dealer, buy some heroin, and go OD in some fucking tenement. Then you can be just like Gloria. I could not have hurt her more if I'd stabbed her in the gut. She opened her mouth to wail, but no sound came. She knew. She knew I was right. She'd become the monster of her childhood. She'd never be the person her father had raised her to be, because there was too much of her mother in her. Because Don had let Gloria get away with her cruelty towards him under the guise of being a good husband. But I wasn't her father. And I wasn't going to rescue her. Her fairy tale was over, and it was all her doing. I turned and started to walk away. I felt Derek's hand on my shoulder, her black knight trying to step up where her white knight had failed her. Dude. You can't talk to, I turned and planted my fist straight in his face. Martial arts had been a long time ago, and I hadn't trained in years, but I could still throw a simple punch. He fell backwards, and I kicked him in the side, my chunky boots bruising him, maybe cracking a rib. He put a hand on the ground to try to push himself up, and I saw red. He'd stolen my dream from me. Now I'd take his. I raised my foot and brought it down as hard as I could, once, twice, three times. I heard bones crack and shatter under the last nod to my misspent youth. He screamed in pain and disbelief, his hand mangled almost beyond recognition. I spat on him. We weren't even, but this was the closest we'd get. Ellie was at his side before I got to the door. Of course. Of course she took his side once again. I was just her husband. She cried out, why, Tim? How can you be so cruel? I just shook my head as I opened the door. You inspired me, Ellie. I guess you're my muse, too.